Section 15 of Monday Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monday Tales by Alphonse Daudet. Translated by Marion McIntyre. Section 15 The Color Sergeant. The regiment was fighting upon an embankment of the railroad and served as a target for the whole prussian army massed opposite them under shelter of the woods officers cried lie down but no one was willing to obey and the valiant regiment remained standing at its post grouped about the ensign under that expanse of sky reddened by the setting sun with pasture lands and fields of ripening wheat in their rear this body of soldiers harassed by the enemy enveloped in dense clouds of smoke reminded one of a herd of cattle surprised upon the open plain by the first whirlwind announcing the approach of a terrible storm a fire of shot and shell rained upon the talus formed by the embankment nothing could be heard but the crackling of the fusillade the sound of canteens falling heavily into the ditch and the lingering echo of bullets which vibrated from one end of the battlefield to the other like the tense strings of some sinister resounding instrument from time to time the flag borne aloft above all stirred by the breath of the fusillade fell amid clouds of smoke and then drowning the sound of the firings of the death rattle and the curses of the wounded rose a stern and dauntless voice to the flag boys to the flag and through the red mist could be seen dimly the shadowy form of an officer rushing forward and the heroic ensign restored to life again soared once more above the field of battle twenty-two times it fell twenty-two times its staff still warm from the clasp of the dying hand which relinquished it was seized again and borne aloft and when the sun had set and all that remained of the regiment a mere handful of men slowly beat the retreat all that was left of the flag was a mere shred in the hands of sergeant hornus the twenty-third standard bearer of that day this sergeant hornus was an old fellow who had served three terms scarcely knew enough to sign his own name and had taken twenty years to win his sergeant's stripes all the wretchedness of a foundling's life all the brutalizing influences of the barracks showed themselves in his low overhanging forehead and back bent beneath the constant burden of his knapsack showed themselves too in that stolid bearing characteristic of a soldier in the ranks and besides he had a slight impediment in his speech but to be color sergeant does not require much eloquence the very evening of the battle his colonel said to him you have the flag my brave fellow keep it and then upon his poor field cloak that had weathered so many battles and storms upon that cloak all faded and worn the cantinier sewed the golden stripe of a sub-lieutenant henceforth that humble life had but one proud aim suddenly the old soldier's form grew erect that poor creature who had marched all his life with bent shoulders and downcast eyes from that day bore himself boldly his glance constantly upraised towards that bit of tattered cloth that he might see it fluttering above him and carry it erect and high so high that not death nor treason nor defeat could touch it you never saw a happier man than hornus upon the day when a battle occurred his staff clasped tightly in both hands and firmly held in its leather sheath he never spoke he scarcely moved he was as solemn as a priest it seemed as though he carried some consecrated thing all his energy all his strength was in the fingers that curled about that beautiful gilded tatter of a flag against which the bullets rushed his whole soul flashed in the eyes which hurled defiance at the prussians facing them squarely with a look that seemed to say come on try to take it from me 
but no one made the attempt, not even death itself. After Bournay, after Gravelotte, the most murderous battles of the campaign, the flag emerged, gashed, rent, pierced with wounds, but no one bore it for a moment except Old Hornus. Then September came, with the army before Metz, the blockade, and that long halt in the mire when the cannon rusted, while the first soldiers in the world, demoralized by inaction, without food, without news, died of fever and ennui at the foot of their guns. Both commanders and soldiers had lost all confidence. Not so old Hornus. He alone still had faith. That tattered tricolor was all in all to him, and as long as he perceived that it was still there, he could not realize that anything had been lost. Unfortunately, as there was no longer any fighting, the colonel kept the colors in his own quarters, outside Metz, and the brave Hornus was almost like a mother that has put her child out to nurse. He thought of his flag ceaselessly and when he grew weary and could endure it no longer, he set out for Metz as fast as he could, and merely because of the fact that he had seen it, and always in the same place, resting quietly against the wall, he returned thence full of courage and patience, and under his wet tent dreamed dreams of battle, and of marching on to victory, with the tricolors unfurled to the breeze, and floating yonder above the Prussian trenches." But one day, at an order of Marshal Bazaine's, all these illusions crumbled. That morning, when Hornus awoke, he found the entire camp in an uproar, the soldiers standing in groups, greatly excited and incensed, uttering cries of rage, and all raising their clenched fists towards the same quarter of the town, as though their anger were aimed at one culprit alone. Cries of, away with him shoot him were heard they said what they would the officers did not attempt to hinder but walked apart from them and with bent heads as if ashamed to look their men in the face and indeed there was cause for shame for to one hundred and fifty thousand men well armed and still able for service had just been read the marshal's order which handed them over to the enemy without even a combat. And the colors demanded Hornus, growing pale. The colors were to be delivered with the rest, the guns, what remained of the equipages, in short, everything. T t tonnerre de Dieu, stammered the poor man. But they shall never have mine, and he started on a run towards the city. There, too, all was excitement and stir. National guards, citizens, the militia were shouting and gesticulating. Deputations passed by on their way to the marshal, murmuring as they went. But Hornus saw and heard nothing of all this. He was busy talking to himself as he climbed the Rue de Faubourg. Take my colors from me? Ah, we shall see. Impossible. Who has the right to do that? Let him give to the Prussians what is his to give, his gilded coaches, his silver plate brought from Mexico. But this thing is my own. It is my honor. I forbid anyone to lay hands upon it. He ran so fast, and his tongue stuttered so, that those bits of phrases were chopped in pieces. But, all the same, lodged somewhere in his brain, he had an idea of his own, this old man. And it was clear enough and it could not be driven out. He had resolved to seize the colors, run into the midst of the regiment with them, and rush upon the Prussians, with all who were ready to follow him. When he reached the colonel's quarters, he was not allowed to enter. The colonel, furious himself at what had happened, would see no one, but Hornus could not take this hint. He swore, shouted, bullied the orderly, insisting, "'My colors!' I will have them. Finally, a window was opened. Is that you, Hornus? Yes, my colonel. I. All the flags are at the arsenal. You have only to go there, and you will get a receipt. A receipt? 
What is that for? It is the marshal's order. But, Colonel, oh, get out and give us peace. Old Hornus staggered like a drunken man. A receipt, a receipt, he repeated mechanically. At last he set out again, understanding one thing only. His colors were now at the arsenal, and he must recover them at any cost. The doors of the arsenal stood wide open, that the Prussians' wagons might pass. There they waited, drawn up in a line in the courtyard. Hornus shuddered as he entered. All the other color-bearers were there, too, fifty or sixty officers, dejected and silent. And those somber carts waiting in the rain, the men grouped, bareheaded, behind them. There was something funereal about it all. In one corner were heaped all the flags of Bazaine's army, lying in utter confusion upon the muddy pavement. Nothing was more saddening than to see those gaudy shreds, those fragments of gold fringe, carved staffs, all those glorious trappings thrown upon the ground and soiled with mud and rain. An officer in charge lifted them one by one, and as his regiment was called, each color-bearer advanced for his receipt. Two Prussian officers watched the loading of the flags, rigid and unmoved. And thus ye departed, O sacred shreds of glory, bearing your wounds, trailing your folds along the pavement like a bird with a broken wings. So ye departed, bearing with you that shame which is the portion of all beautiful things once they have been sullied, and a bit of France herself went with the going of each flag. The sun of many a long day's march still lingered in your faded folds, where the mark of many a bullet guarded the memory of the nameless dead, slain by the shots chance hurled against the banner they defended. Hornus, it's your turn. They are calling you. Go and get your receipt. As if he cared about that. His flag was before him, his very own, the most beautiful, the most mutilated of all. And as he saw it again, it seemed to him that he stood once more upon the talus. He heard the bullets whistle, the dented canteens, the voice of his colonel, to the flag, boys, to the flag. There he saw his twenty-two comrades, stretched upon the field, and he, the twenty-third, rushing on to raise the colors, to support the flag which tottered, for the arm that had held it had relaxed its hold. Ah, on that day he had sworn to defend, to protect that flag even unto death, and now, thinking of that, all his heart's blood seemed to surge to his brain. Intoxicated, dazed, he rushed upon the Prussian officer, seized that beloved ensign, and grasped it in both hands. He attempted to raise it as of old, erect and high, crying to the flag. But his voice was lost in his throat. He felt the staff tremble, slip from his hands. In that enervating, death-like atmosphere which weighs so heavily upon a conquered city, the flag itself was powerless to float. No valiant heart could breathe such an atmosphere and live. Old Hornus fell to earth, as though a stroke of lightning had crushed him. End of section 15. Recording by Linda Johnson.